Here we are, the fifth Sunday of Easter. Easter continues, and by that I mean that the resurrection of Jesus was not meant to be just a one-day miracle that we could point to and proclaim, wow, he really is God. Or even if we say, alleluia. The resurrection of Jesus changed things forever. And the resurrection expands as we read in the Acts of the Apostles. And maybe that would be better titled, The Acts of God Through the Apostles. It continues yet today. Last week, an explorers group, the COS explorers, made Easter lilies from their hand prints. They traced their hands, and then they made a lily out of that by, by putting it together, putting a stem on it. And it was a reminder that the resurrection continues through God's people, through the apostles that we read about in Acts, through witnesses throughout history, and through us still today. A case study as an example. Take Peter, for instance. He heals in the name of Jesus in a previous chapter, Aeneas, a man who had been bedridden for eight years. It is not Peter in his own power who heals, but it is the risen Lord who heals through Peter, the resurrected Lord, indeed still lives to heal. Then last week we read of Tabitha called Dorcas by her Greek friends, being raised to life again, to live and to continue serving Christ. And again, Peter is the representative agent of the miracle, but he's not the agency of the miracle. That again is the risen Lord working through Peter. The resurrection continues through faithful vessels. It was not Peter who was stronger than physical paralysis, nor was Peter more powerful than death. That was Jesus. The work of Jesus Christ did not cease once he had ascended again to heaven. Just a little note here, spoiler alert. Watch for information about an Ascension Day service that's coming here in one fashion or another. That power was shared with his followers then and still is today. And the living Christ still meets people today as well. Maybe not as dramatically as in some of the stories that we read in Acts, such as Paul's uh, meeting on the Damascus Way. But Jesus meets us today nonetheless. In the book of Acts, we experience that Easter continues. Then today we read, not of the living Christ's power over disease or illness or over death itself, but over human boundaries or categories of, categories of people, social and religious con constructs of difference that humans make up and then follow. I don't know about you, but if I were an editor and looking at what Luke did here in this book, and he's trying to build a climax that proves that the resurrection changes everything. And I think I would have saved Tabitha's story for last. It seems like bringing a person back to life is the most dramatic story to show Christ's continuing presence and power through God's people. But maybe not. That Gentiles have been included in God's salvific plan may feel so familiar to us, most of us Gentiles, I'm assuming, and so out of our normal understanding of the divisions of cultural and religious context that it feels natural or expected. So when we read of Cornelius' household becoming Christians and the Holy Spirit falling on them, very few of us probably drop our jaws, <laughs> but it was a jaw dropping event. I'm so grateful to God for including me and you in that inclusion, but it doesn't register as earth-shattering news, but it did to Peter, and it did to those who understood their identity as the people of God that was so firmly bound to the covenant given to Abraham and lived out in obedience with all that entailed, circumcision, dietary dictates, 
a prescribed understanding of what is holy and what is unholy, what is clean and what is unclean, as an in-group and then the rest of the world being the out-group. Of course, there had been some exceptions, people outside of Israel becoming part of their shared life and beliefs, but they usually joined by joining themselves to Israel, and that was the perceived only way to God. So in a sense, Israel was the mediator between outsiders and God. You became Jewish, and that is how you became close to God. Abraham had received the covenant originally and heard God say that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him, through that covenant, but nothing could prepare Peter and others for how God would do that. God would need to act dramatically if the ingrained traditions and scriptural interpretation and self-understanding and identity as God's people were to change according to God's design. And that's exactly what God did. Okay. Do we even have a fire alarm? Is that from outside? Oh, okay. There you go. See, God is trying to get your attention. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I said it had to be dramatic. Okay. Okay. That's exactly what God did. God did something dramatically. And we read it today in the arrangement of the Revised Common Lectionary, Year C, Easter 5. This is, in fact, the longest narrative in Acts, and one that is repeated twice for emphasis. So we need to pay attention, right? The passage we read today is really only the summary of Peter's experience that he shares with those who assume he has betrayed the covenant and broken faith with God, his accusers. Peter can only share his experience because at this point in time, there is no textual witness that he can point to to support what God seemed to be doing. And nothing in their interpretation of the Hebrew scriptures would take God's mercy and God's love this far. This was far for God to go. We see the continuity in ways they could not see it in that moment in time. And so Peter shares what he's experienced and how God has orchestrated everything. And we rejoice to see how masterfully and miraculously God has ordained these events. God has given complimentary visions to Peter and Cornelius, just as he did with Paul and Ananias. Cornelius is a God-fearer. Now that is someone who respected Jewish beliefs, who prayed to the Jewish God, who gave to charity and the things that, that might be pleasing to God, but did not go all the way, did not become a convert to Judaism. He's obviously a Gentile because he's a centurion. He leads approximately 100 soldiers for the Roman Empire, the oppressive empire that's occupying Israel. He's a man of war, a ruler, a slaveholder, we hear, a person of wealth, and wealth for the Romans most often came by squeezing out funds from the poor, in this case, the poor of Israel. But he's a praying man, and while he prays, God sends an angel and tells Cornelius to send for Simon Peter to hear, hear how he and his household can find salvation. Now, God could have thrown that angel just told him how to become saved, right? But this story is not just about Cornelius' salvation and conversion. This is about Peter's conversion as well. Peter needed to understand the wideness of God's mercy, and this was in part Peter's lesson. So while God sends an angel to Cornelius, God gives Peter a threefold vision while he is on the rooftop praying. Interesting that both times God is speaking and opening the way as these men are praying. A sheet comes down from heaven 
filled with all kinds of creatures, clean and those known to be unclean by observant Jews. And the command comes with it and is heard, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Peter's expected reply, no way, nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth, Lord. And again and again. The light is dawning on Peter that his categories of clean and unclean must change to be in alignment with God's message that is growing in its effect and influence and grace. I'll admit the sheet scene not only confused Peter, but it also confuses me a little as well because I'm coming at it from a Wegmans mentality, a consumerism perspective. So how Peter is instructed to rise up and kill and eat is a bit of a stretch for me, an interpretive stretch to see how he goes from there to say, oh, he's talking about the Gentiles, you know, to kill and eat, and then, oh, this is about the Gentiles, and God is accepting them too. It's a leap in interpretation. But if we consider food as what we take in, until it is truly part of us, then it takes on another layer of meaning. Those you previously named unclean will be part of the body of Christ, Peter. Peter, they will be mystically joined together with Israel, and that means to you as well. And while Peter is considering what this all means, there's a knock at the door. And Peter goes to the door and invites these men in. And he will go with them after he's offered them hospitality, lodging, food, drink, and rest. Don't you feel his conversion already happening? First, Peter is staying at a tanner's home. And that person would be unclean only because he has to touch death all the time as animal skins are made into leather. And together, those seekers and Peter and the few other believers that Peter takes with him travel to see Cornelius and what God is up to. Willie James Jennings writes this, together they all travel, they sojourn, into the depths of divine longing. Beautiful. It's divine longing it's not Peter's longing. It was unimaginable to Peter, not something that he longed for to see God's grace open up to the Gentile world. And this wasn't part of a church growth plan for Peter either, where he's saying, well, the Gentiles are an untapped demographic, so maybe we could go there and enlarge the church there. No, this is God's longing, God's divine longing. Again, a quote from Jennings. God's guiding hand is not the new thing here, but now God reveals the immeasurable size of those hands. They reach out to capture the lives of Gentiles, and they reach deeply into our own hopes and prayers. Peter learned how wide and deep, broad and high, how immense the grace of God is, and this is, in so many ways, as much about Peter's conversion than about Cornelius and his household. Will Peter slip up at times? Yes. Read Galatians. But he's on a journey to keep up with God's flowing mercy that swells and rises beyond the boundaries of his understanding or what he can even imagine or take in. And as he shares what he's witnessed God's do God doing, others join in the praise with a sense of awe they say after his testimony, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. Peter has learned to listen. Peter, who was not very good at listening all through the Gospels that we've read, has learned to listen to God. And Peter has learned to listen to other people's experiences. And he's even learned to listen to the questions from his opponents. Again, another quote from Jennings. And I would recommend that you buy Jennings' study on Acts because it is such a beautiful book. 
Jennings says this, this is the key currency, listening. This is the key currency of the new order. This is the engine that will operationalize holy joining, listening. Listening for what God is doing listening for how God is leading in our present times too, but listening to the word already spoken in scripture and faithful witnesses of the church throughout the ages as well. As well, as well. Now, if you're newer to COS, you may never have experienced listening circles that we sometimes do. When we make major decisions here, like when we decided to become a freestanding congregation independent from Edgewood Free Methodist Church that supported us in our early efforts, or when we decided to purchase this property with all the many needs that this building had, when we consider accessibility issues in this old building, and that one was interrupted by COVID and other factors, but it's still there for us. And when we think about our missional focus, then we've come together in listening circles, in the old Quaker tradition of listening to one another and believing that God speaks through God's people in the way that you know how the Spirit is leading is if you come together and you listen. And you're not allowed to interrupt the other person and disagree. Or you're not allowed to even agree with the other person because that might give that person's ideas fuel that others might not share. But simply to listen to one another. That everyone has a voice and that God speaks through those voices as well as through scripture and the wider church. And that those voices as part of Christ's body are important to hear. We're called to listen intently to one another's experiences and questions and concerns and ideas, to recognize God's spirit coordinating needs matched with giftedness or hunger matched with spiritual and physical nourishment or loneliness changed to belonging. Those the world or the church would view as outsiders must find room at this table where love is genuinely shared and care is genuinely felt and feelings of alienation or worthlessness are overcome by respect and value and the recognition of the depth of God's love, how wide the mercy of God when, in his parting words, Jesus gives a new commandment to love as he loves, none of the disciples could have imagined who would be invited into that love. None of them sitting there would have thought, I think he might be speaking of the Gentiles or the world at large. None of them could understand the largeness of the table of God in Christ even as we are invited this morning to eat and drink together, let's not view this meal as an intimate dinner party, but a feast that's offered to all with a wide invitation, with a wide redemption. Whenever there are hesitancies to cross boundaries, then there's a knock at the door that, like Peter heard, we should be hearing Whenever we feel something in us tighten at the possibility of inviting others, or whenever we just look at someone and think God's grace is probably not going to be operative in their life, not because I say so, but they just don't seem like the type that God is going to call, then we're called to share, to welcome, to offer hospitality, and to listen. And then to share the story of Jesus and to find an intimate, connect, intimate connection as part of Christ's body. I admit that this morning was hard for me to, to uh, go ahead with the sermon that I had written yesterday. I stayed off Facebook and things like that yesterday and I didn't turn on the news. And so it wasn't until this morning that I heard about the shooting that has happened in Buffalo with 10 people killed and three more injured. 
a racially motivated shooting. And it just strikes me that the church sometimes doesn't know exactly what to do with that. <laughs> Even if we don't share in that racial hatred, how are we becoming a people of the resurrection, a people of life over death, a people that hold forth life in a way that death truly is dealt a death-defying blow. What are we doing? We can pray, and that's good. We can refuse to be part of that evil, and that's good. But we're Easter people, and we need to make um, in-grounds into those places where hatred is so prevalent. We need to lead the way as Christ has shown us by life over death. And so these ending words sound a little bit hollow in light of that, but they're still true. The church always has to lead the way. The new command to love as Christ has loved either lives in us or we have fooled ourselves into an anti-gospel message. There is no way to ignore the hatred in the world and to not love fully as Christ has loved and to not cross boundaries and to be in the gospel. It is ours not only to grieve the hatred in the world around us, but to do something about it. We hold the invitation to join, to sit at the table, because we're Easter people, and we continue Easter just as the apostles did just as the church has done through the ages, and each age has a question to deal with. Each age has things that they have to consider, and they have to listen to one another to come to the answers that the Spirit is leading us to. Differences enrich the meal together. May the Holy Spirit fall fresh in our midst and go out from here in our lives, lest God's redemptive work be hindered. And as Peter said, who can hinder God, not us.